again, I'm Mel Hightower, and it is my pleasure to welcome to the stage two incredible women who are really driving change locally here in New York through Giving Circles. It's my pleasure to introduce you to Andine Sutajari, who is, serves on the steering committee of the Asian Women's Giving Circle, the first and largest giving circle in the US that's led by Asian American women. Also with us today, Deborah McManus, who in 1999 co-founded the Giving Circle, Well Met Philanthropy, or Well Met Giving, Well Met Philanthropy, and has really been a force in giving in the two decades since. Andine, Deborah, welcome. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thanks for having us. Thank you for being here. All right, Deborah. Yes, ma'am. You formed your giving circle first, so you get the pleasure of the first question. <laughs> Um, yes. <laughs> so, I'd love to understand what prompted you to convene women in this way through a giving circle rather than instead, say, writing a check. I think a lot of us have written checks, uh, and there is a certain amount of satisfaction in doing that, and it, obviously it's very useful, but um, there's a disconnect. Uh, and I think many of us, uh, I was in my 50s when my friends and I started this wanted to um, be more personally involved, be more personally responsible, uh, and moved uh, by uh, people who uh, were starting organizations to try to better their neighborhoods. Most of these people um, are just extraordinary. It's, it's the one thing that, that is a common denominator. Anyone who starts a 501c3 from scratch, from, from an idea, from social outrage, uh, is an extraordinary person, and we are always lucky to meet those people who do make a change and are uh, the leaders of, of their communities and the le our leaders for the next decades. I love that. So you're really incubating nonprofits. Yes, absolutely. We're okay. usually their first givers because uh, the thing about WellMet is we search for uh, brand new 501c3s the ones who haven't received grants before or are not known or have no track record, but they're for us. Uh, and uh, it's really a privilege to help them even a little bit. Thank you. Undine, yeah. giving circles have really a distinct structure. Yes. They're incredibly inclusive, right. egalitarian. Right. Were those features that attracted you to your giving circle? Yes. and. Um, I also just want to point out that every culture has a tradition of giving, right? We have tithing, we have sedekah, we have zakat, we have in the Korean community get, and in the Indo Indonesian community where I come from, it's called arisan. So I've been giving with my grandmother ever since I was six years old when she would pick me up from school and we'd go to one of her ladies' lunches. Mm -hmm. And at each lady's lunch, each month, they would put a bowl at the table and they would write a check hmm. and um, give that money to one of the ladies at that lunch who needed it the most. So there's this, I've always had this tradition around giving and a tradition around community giving. And I think that's what's really attracted me to giving circles is the structure, the inclusivity, the values are being clarified and being fossilized and, and utilized by the community itself. And so when I found the Asian Women's Giving Circle, I said, oh my gosh, this is similar to what I did with my grandmother, where me and 12 other women would sit together in a room, talk about grant making, make dumplings, and <laughs> live and laugh and share stories together. And I think philanthropy you know, is the love of humankind, the love of humanity, so bringing in the human aspect towards giving is something that really attracted me to yeah. the giving culture, structure and culture. Right. Yeah. That connection is critical for giving. Deborah, tell us a bit about WellMet and how your giving circle works. One of the things that we did when we first started WellMet is we realized, as I say, we were in our 50s, although we're a three-generational group, um, but uh, that New York women are busy. And, uh, and so it, we couldn't ask our friends, because we all started off by asking our friends who we thought would, might be interested. 
Uh, so we uh, realized that we, would, uh, we couldn't have too many meetings, we couldn't have too many demands. So we have four meetings a year, uh, and plus one site visit. And the site visit, of course, is the height of the, of the entire thing because we get to go, two or three of us at the most, go to visit um, our potential grantees and, uh, and learn from them. We watch them in action. We spend probably three or four hours there, ask lots of questions, but we are their guests. Mm -hmm. And we try to be very mindful of that rather than coming on as Lady Bountiful types, okay. which is an anathema. But at uh, any rate, so uh, it's those four meetings plus the, the site visit. And that's pretty much it, although we have started now to have workshops for our past grantees to help them with things like how to form a board or um, well, just basic, basic organizational skills, how to read a, read a, a 990, things like that. That was for us. Um, but uh, uh, it's, it's very simple and it's not terribly time consuming. Uh, I think we might change that a little bit, but not too much. Yeah, it's wonderful because I think when people think of giving circles, they think about this Herculean commitment yeah. that they have to make. Yes, and that wouldn't have flown at all for us. Yeah. So. Deborah, we heard from Andine about the connection to culture for her giving circle, but women in particular are drawn to giving circles, that collaboration, um, the in-person way of giving. It's a little different than what you see nowadays when it comes to giving, online giving, mm -hmm. um, giving through mailing campaigns where you can actually find and donate to a charity without ever interacting with a person. Why do you think that way of giving appeals to women in particular? I think we care about other people, uh, not to say that men don't at all, but, but there's, personal connections, I believe, and I know this is profiling or some such thing, but I think we enjoy meeting people and seeing who they are and what's important to them and how to make them laugh and, and seeing what their, their lives are like. I think it's, it's special to us, and it's one of the reasons we have stayed in all women's circle. Yeah, so seeing that impact, yeah. and that's a recurring thing that we keep hearing about yeah, sure. with women's philanthropy. Undine, yes. we just heard how powerful a force moms can be uh -huh. in our lives. And as I understand it, you actually had to have a, a sort of a persuasive conversation with your mom right. about joining a giving circle yes. and convincing her that this was a great way to participate. Tell us a little bit about that and what you said to her. Yes. Well, I joined my giving circle when I was 26. So at that time, really, you know, had financial power or um, agency to give, but not of my own resources. And I'm third generation from my mom's side. We give in Indonesia through our family office. And I knew that I had the potential to move our resources from our home country to where I was living in New York City to contribute to the communities I'm in. So I knew the Giving Circle was the first place I wanted to start. I called up my mom and said, hey, mommy, I have. <laughs> I have met this wonderful woman, the founder of our Giving Circle, Holly Lee, and she asked me to join this group of amazing change makers and leaders, and we give grants each year to organizations in New York City. She said, but your home is in Indonesia. Like, we give locally. And I said, this is local me for me now. New York City, Asian women, artists, funding small grants that have the potential to impact great things in the world. And she said, well, put in your own money first for the year and let's see how it goes. So I did, I made the stretch and the second year, she heard me still talk about it. I sent her materials every single time. I couldn't stop talking about it. I was so passionate. She matched my gift. Oh, wow, that's nice. So now in thinking about how I give with my family, it's now more of a conversation. The giving circle was really the first step towards me having a conversation on philanthropy and my own agency as a next generation to make an impact in my local community, which is New York City. Right, and yeah. you talked earlier about the tradition of giving in your culture that mm. sort of you grew up with, mm -hmm. right? So the giving circle for you, it's not just the community connection, it's really honoring your culture. Yeah, it's, I think it's honoring everyone's culture. Right, I yeah. think that each of us give in multiple ways, time, our talent, our treasure, and ties. And given that a giving circle is a volunteer-led organization, we activate all of our resources in the work that we do. 
we give our time, I give my talents as a philanthropic advisor, as a facilitator, I give my treasure, my financial resources, and I give my ties. We advocate, we market the work that we do. So it feels really empowering to know that it's not just my money, it is my money that's making a difference, but it's all of who I am. And it's I'm your a, life. Yes, yeah, exactly. Doing it with your life. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's that full intellectual, philanthropic, social, investment capital, all working in the same thing yes. way. So final question for you, just curious, you have you know, the privilege of actually connecting and aligning your work with your purpose, yeah. right? You advise next-gen donors such yes. as yourself yeah. on how to make that connection. And in our research, we found that millennials, more so than Gen Xers or boomers, mm -hmm. um, are really, really focused on the impact that their dollars make. So yes. in your work, you know, how do you see millennial women mm -hmm. ensuring that impact in a different approach? Yeah, two things I could share about this. The first is really um, this both and mentality, right? We can make money and give money at the same time. We don't have to wait until we're older, until we retire, until we've amassed some kind of wealth and financial independence to give money. So social entrepreneurship is something that we are thinking about. Impact investing is something that we're thinking about. Um, giving with lenses, so understanding that giving doesn't have to happen later, it can happen now, number one. Um, and then number two, I really think it's about, um, I spoke to a donor last week who said, my grandparents, who are boomers, sit down, are quiet, and watch and read the newspaper. My parents, who are Gen Xers, sit down, are quiet, and watch TV. <laughs> and me and my cousins sit down and are on our phones. <laughs> so the way that we gather information is very different nowadays. We want to see impacts now, right? We want to, we're much closer to the things that are happening in the world. We have access to information. Right. So we are more in tune, arguably, with what's urgent and what's needed in our communities. Um, it's in front of us, it's everywhere. Yeah, it's that real time yes. access to information that's really driving that. Deborah, as I think about giving circles, one of the incredible things about them is that everyone gives the same amount, yes. whether it's $100, $1,000, or more, mm -hmm. right? And everyone has, it's sort of one amount, one vote yes. in the giving circle. How important is it that giving circles are really employed to, I think of it as democratizing philanthropy? Well, that's interesting because we were having a conversation before this and, and um, your structure is a bit different than ours, but um, I, I, we started off with the, the we give $5,000 each a year and uh, it, that's, it gives us enough money because we're a very small group. We're 36 women, so 36 times five, which is one of the reasons I would like to grow it a little bit. Mm -hmm. But um, it just seemed that we all had the same kind of commitment, at least financial commitment. I'm, quite, I'm beginning to question this a little bit. I'm not quite sure that that's necessary. Mm -hmm. One of the things that it does is it, it, it restricts the membership to women with 5,000 extra dollars a, a year. And I don't know, there are, are other qualities and other assets that are, can't be measured in money. Yeah, so potentially ability-based giving might be yeah, something I'm, that you I'm, about. I am but one voice in our organization, but it is something that I'm thinking about. Right. And it must be incredibly satisfying when you think about impact to see the impact of your dollars at work. Oh. Can you share with us one of your favorite gr grantee stories? <laughs> yes. Um, there is this organization called I Challenge Myself, and stop me if I go on too much because I'm yeah passionate about that one. It was started by a fabulous woman, uh, Ana Reyes, about, oh gosh, 10 or so years ago. And uh, she, uh, she noticed a whole bunch of things about public school kids, uh, high school kids. One is that they usually don't get a lot of exercise, partly because gym isn't around anymore. Uh, and also they, they, their diet isn't very good. And all those things have uh, implications in other areas as well. So she decided she was going to teach these kids how to ride bikes. I don't know where that came from, but it did. And so she uh, got some donations of bicycles, and uh, so she started teaching these children who have never ridden bikes. 
And, um, and then they would go farther and farther, and she developed a college education uh, preparation program. And so now, every, almost every year, uh, these kids who started with going around the block, they pedal up to, say, Bard College, which is upstate New York. Uh, they come in as a team. They've already made um, appointments with the admissions directors. They get to stay overnight. Some of them have never been out of the Bronx or their neighborhoods. Uh, and so they see what it's like to be on a college campus uh, and uh, eat in a cafeteria and all that. And then they go biking on to the next, uh, the next college. They visit usually four or five colleges in their tour, which is about 10 or so days. And I don't know how they do it, but uh, they do. And I think it's absolutely fabulous. Wonderful. And Undine, what about you? Do you have a donor story you can quick tell us a bit about? Yeah, just very quickly. As I mentioned, we fund um, really um, small grants to scale for the organization and the artists to scale. We fund women artists in New York City. Um, there's one particular called the Vietnamese um, Boat Podcast. So talking about refugees, and it really is a way to share stories around resilience, around trauma, um, on what it's like to come to America on a boat and escape war. Um, and these are sort of the programs and the stories that we like to fund. They change narratives, they change the way that people see Asian Americans, and they also preserve history. Um, and that's one um, of the one that we love to talk about. I personally love to talk about. Um, it, the podcast went from just over 100 followers on Instagram to now having 42,000 um, wow. and featured on NPR. So these are sort of the types of projects that we like to support. You know, when no funders funded them before, um, we put a platform out and amplify their work. Right. And final question to you both, where can we find out more about your giving circle, Undine? Yes, thank you. Um, www.asianwomengivingcircle.org. Yeah. Wonderful. Deborah? And we also have a website. It's Well, well Met Philanthropy. And uh, please check it out. Uh, I, I hope that some of you might be interested in joining us. <laughs> Thank you so much for joining us. This shows us that you can never underestimate the power of collective giving. Thank you again. Thanks very Thank much. Thank you. Thank you.